Good morning, panelists and audience. My name is Cheryl Hing, and I'm the project manager for Team Ascension. Today, we'll be, give, we'll be giving you our system validation review on Hades, which is our high altitude deployment system. So today, we'll be also be going over the um, design team structure, introduction of Hades, system definition, subsystem validation, integration, system validation, programmatics, and lessons learned. For our design team structure, we have myself as project manager, Joshua Shainer as our propulsion subsystem lead, Matthew Viz as our payload subsystem lead, Jeffrey Hughes as our electronic subsystem lead, and finally Andrew Byrd as our assistant project manager. So Hades is designed to fly to an altitude of 100 meters, loiter at state altitude, have a total mission time of 20 minutes, Carry five payloads to safe altitude, release those five payloads, and then return safely to ground. So here's an image of how the design, our design will look like on the proposed test site. For our concept of operations, we have the RAID cylinder, which is our operational cylinder where the system shall not leave once it is armed for mission. Our yellow cylinder, which is our safety cylinder, is where no personnel shall enter once the system is on for mission. The blue cylinder being our deploy payload deployment cylinder where no payload shall drift out of once they are deployed. In this view, you can better see the simulated, simulated system flight path in gray and the simulated payload flight path in green. Here's a video of how, our, how Hades is designed to work. <coughs> First, we'll ascend to an altitude of 100 meters. Loiter at state altitude for approximately 19 minutes. Deploy the five payloads. Each of the payloads will be returning to ground with the aid of a parachute. And finally, our system will return safely to ground. And now I'd like to turn it over to Andrew Burr for system definition. Thank you, Cheryl. As mentioned, my name is Andrew Burr, and I'm the assistant project manager for Team Ascension. Today I'll be going over the system definition. As the assistant project manager, I'm also the integration team lead. The other members of the team include Jessica Jansen, Adam Case, and Samantha Watson. Hades is composed of four different subsystems. Those subsystems being propulsion, structures, electronics, and payloads. Taking a closer look at the propulsion and electronic subsystems, we'll see that the electronic subsystem powers the motor as well as the electronic speed controller. The motor spins the propellers, and the electronic subsystem handles the attitude control as well as the communication with the platform. Taking a closer look at the structures and payload subsystems, we'll see that the main base of the structure show, has a ring as well as four legs. This maintains the structure while the payloads <coughs> sit right underneath the ring on a payloads bar. Final component of the structure subsystem is the electronics bar. This houses our electronic subsystem. All of these subsystems come together to create our Hades system. Shown here is a picture of our design broken into four different colors, each of the colors corresponding to a different subsystem. In gray, we'll see the structure subsystem. In blue, propulsion, which sits around the outer ring of the structure. Turning your attention to the center of the structure, we'll see the electronic subsystem shown in red. Just below the ring, the payload sits, subsystem sits and is connected to the structure using an orange nylon string. Looking a little closer at this, we'll see the nylon string is designed to be deployed using a hot nichrome wire. Once the nichrome wire severs the nylon string, the payload will deploy. Now I'd like to invite up Joshua Shainer to discuss the propulsion subsystem.
Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Shainer. I am the Propulsion Subsystem Lead, and I will be discussing our experimental validation. Also on the Propulsion Subsystem is Matthew Boyle, who will be coming up in just a few minutes to discuss our experimental data and some future recommendations that we have. The one subsystem requirement that we had that needed to be experimentally validated was that the propulsion subsystem shall generate a thrust magnitude that is greater than or equal to 264.6 newtons worth of thrust. Now this value was derived from a minimum thrust to weight ratio of the system of 1.5 to allow for the system to ascend to its required altitude and remain controlled and maneuverable for the entire 20 minute mission while there. In order to test this, we performed a subsystem thrust test where the metric involved, or investigated, excuse me, was the maximum continuous subsystem thrust uh, by the subsystem. Shown here is our thrust test setup. Um, for the propulsion test assembly and the propulsion system in general, each motor, electronic speed controller, or ESC, and propeller was marked individually and matched to its respective part, and this is how it would be assembled in the final system. Uh, we did this so that all the parts were kept together with their respective uh, counterparts, so that when everything was integrated back into the system, everything would be uh, right where we designed it. And this is how everything was tested. We also borrowed a battery from the electronic subsystem and used this to power the, the setup so that everything and all, excuse me, all of the flight parts would be tested prior to their integration into the rest of the system. Uh, to be able to test the thrust coming out of the propellers during the testing, we used a cantilever beam style load cell, which required an excitation voltage from the power supply shown on the left of the screen. That excitation voltage went through the power cell and then out into our data acquisition, which sent the output voltage to a computer terminal which was outside of this view, which I'll show you in just a minute, where the technician would read off thrust in real time. Shown on the left is a close-up of the propulsion test assembly. It has the cantilever beam load cell as well as an adapter plate for the motor and then the propulsion sub-assembly. You can also see the electronic speed controller or ESC shown at the bottom of that picture. On the right, you can see the blast shields that were used to protect the technicians that were running this testing. These were mostly precautionary um, because we were running these propellers fairly close and even sometimes, ex sometimes ex exceeding the maximum recommended RPM for these propellers, we wanted to make sure that everyone was going to be safe throughout all of this testing. You can also see the computer terminal that was used and that some of the data is still on that screen. Here is a close-up of the propulsion test assembly where we have the load cell, motor, adapter, plates, and also the propulsion sub-assembly shown clearly here. Now I'd like to pass it off to Matthew Boyle who will be discussing our experimental validation. Thank you, Joshua. Once again, my name is Matthew Boyle, and I will be discussing the propulsion subsystem experimental validation. Now, shown in this table above is all of the experimental maximum thrust values that we got during testing, as well as the calculated maximum theoretical uh, maximum thrust values for each test. As you'll notice, propellers two and five do not have a maximum theoretical thrust. That is because during <coughs> testing, we were having issues with our tachometer and we were unable to record the maximum RPM that our motor spun at for those two tests. Therefore, without this value known, we were unable to calculate the maximum theoretical thrust. However, if we were to just look at the four propellers where we were able to calculate a maximum theoretical thrust, experimentally, we were able to generate about 197 newtons worth of thrust, while theoretically, we should have been seeing about 208 newtons worth of thrust. This means that over the four propellers tested, they, they were averaging about producing three newtons of thrust less than what we theoretically should have been seeing. Now, th we believe that this is due to the assumptions in our calculations, as well as possible vibrations from our motor testing. Now, looking back at all six propellers, experimentally, we were able to generate about 290 newtons worth of thrust. Now, this value is greater than our required 264.6 newtons of thrust, Therefore, we find that this requirement is, or is experimentally validated. Now, if we were to run this test again, we would first suggest to not use a cantilever beam style load cell. That is because the cantilever beam style load cell allowed for a lot of vibration during testing, and it could have altered our data. 
We would also like to use a horizontal style motor test stand instead of the vertical one that we used to allow for better airflow through the propeller. Finally, we would have also liked to use a tachometer with data logging capabilities so that we can match each specific RPM to each specific thrust output instead of just a maximum thrust output with a maximum RPM. Next, I'd like to hand it off to Jeffrey Hughes, who will be discussing the electronic subsystem. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Hughes, and I will be covering the electronic subsystem. I am the electronics team lead, and with me on the electronic subsystem are Jessica Tertius and Eugene Kim. The, sub excuse me, the requirements of the electronic subsystem are as follows. The electronic subsystem shall have a minimum capacity of 37.75 <coughs> amp hours. The electronic subsystem shall not exceed 80% total depth of discharge for each battery. And the electronic subsystem shall communicate over a range of up to 212 meters. The two tests that were designed or that were designed in order to experimentally validate these requirements were the battery capacity test, which used a metric of battery capacity, which is a measurement of charge, and battery depth of discharge, which is a percentage of charge. For the uh, communication range test, we used the metric of distance, as in the distance that the, that the electronic subsystem would be communicating. The components of interest for the battery capacity test were the three 6-cell, 16-amp-hour lithium polymer batteries, which we purchased. For the communication range test, the components of interest were the 3DR Radio V2 transceiver set, which was borrowed by Dr. Brian Davis, the Spectrum DX6 manual controller, which was borrowed from the UAS department here at Edgar Riddle Aeronautical University, and the Spectrum AR610 manual receiver, which was also borrowed from Edgar Riddle Aeronautical University's UAS department. The purpose of the battery capacity test was to ensure that the electronic subsystem could supply 37.75 amp hours to the platform without discharging below 80% of each battery. These figures come from our simulation and our knowledge of lithium polymer batteries. The assumption we made with the battery capacity test was since each battery was identical and they were brand new, any measured capacity difference would be negligible. The battery capacity test was conducted by discharging a fully charged 16 amp hour 6 cell lithium polymer battery at a rate of 1 amp using a Thunder Power TP820HVC which was borrowed from the UAS department of Edgar Riddle. It was discharged until the cell voltages within the battery were each 3.7 volts which corresponds to an 80% depth of discharge of this battery. The data we were interested in from this test was labeled CAP, shown here, which indicated the amount of charge that was discharged from a battery during a given discharge cycle. The purpose of the communication range test was to ensure that the platform could communicate over the 212 meter distance that was required of it. This number was generated from our safety cylinder distance. This test utilized a test drone, which was borrowed from the UAS Department of Denver Riddle Aeronautical University. You can see in blue uh, signals the manual control, which is done by the transmitter and the manual receiver, and the autonomous control in red, which is accomplished by the two transceiver sets. And we tested both forms of these communications. The test was conducted at the lower fields of Ember Riddle Aeronautical University, shown in the red box. Taking a closer look, we can see the red dotted line, which indicates the 212 meter distance that was measured, and the red circular markers indicate the different testing locations of the communication. We used multiple testing locations in order to ensure that we would have multiple data points and continuous communication from the ground station to the 212 meter mark. The Manual control communication was tested by taking the test drone to each one of these 11 points and throttling the motors using the manual controller. The autonomous control communication was tested by reading the received signal strength indicator shown in the flight data window of Mission Planner, which indicates the received signal strength, which is a 
measurement of the received decibel milliwatts over a manufacturer specified max possible received signal strength in decibel milliwatts. That concludes the electronic subsystem test overview. I would now like to welcome Jessica Tercios to discuss the electronic subsystem experimental validation. Thanks, Jeff. My name is Jessica Tercios, and I will be going over the electronic subsystem experimental validation. I'll start off with the battery capacity test. This table shows the capacity discharge during each of the four discharge cycles used to deplete the battery to 80% depth of discharge. This value, these values were then summed to obtain a total capacity discharge. These values can be seen on this table here, along with our numeric, the results from our numerical validation. As can be seen, both of the values for the experimental and numerical validation were above the 37.75 amp hours required. So this requirement was experimentally and numerically validated. For the depth of discharge requirement, both of these values were below the 80% limit set for this requirement. So this was also experimentally and numerically validated. Moving on to the communication of range test, this plot shows the received signal strength from the autonomous receiver as a function of distance from the mission control station. As can be seen, this Receive signal strength decreases as you move further away from the mission control station, but it remains within an acceptable range for the duration of the test. These values can also be seen on this table showing the results for the manual receiver as well. We were able to communicate through for the entire 212 meter distance validating this requirement as well. In conclusion, all experiment all Requirements for the electronic subsystem were experimentally and numerically validated. Improvements that can be made to this test are to test the, the capacity of all three batteries rather than testing the capacity of one battery and applying that to all three batteries. I would now like to pass it off to Matthew Viss to discuss the payload subsystem. Thank you, Jessica. My name is Matthew Viss, and I'll be discussing the payload subsystem. As the payload subteam lead, I had the fortune of working with Jason Lafferty and Garrett Traeger. The payload subsystem has a total of four requirements. The first being that there shall be five physically independent payloads. Next, that each of the payloads shall have a mass of two kilograms or less. Each of the payloads shall survive an impact force of 174.3 newtons or less. And finally, that the sensor elements within each payload shall collect data at a rate of 100 hertz or less. Each of these four requirements does directly correspond to one design metric, and each of the design metrics has exactly one corresponding test for it. The first of which is testing the number of payloads requirement with the five payloads test. For this test, we gathered all of the payloads that are manufactured and counted them one through five. The second test was for the payloads mass requirement. For this, we again gathered all of the payloads, but this time we put each of them on a scale individually and measured their mass. Next, for the payload impact force requirement, we took the, one of the payloads, took the expensive electronics out of it, put it on the ground so that the smallest face of the payload would be on the ground and sticking face straight up into the air. We then took a metal rod and a PVC pipe and measured the mass of the rod to calculate a distance that it would need to be dropped from to impact at, a, at as close to 174.3 newtons as possible. And then we dropped it from that height onto the rod. With this, we did make the assumption that the virtual point force from the rod would be greater than any distributed force that would be from the payload actually impacting the ground, and as such, it would be sufficient to validate the requirement. Last but not least, we did the data collection rate test for the data collection requirement. For this test, we turned on the sensor elements, let them run for a specified period of time, stopped them, took the data out of them, and counted the number of data points from each of the sensors. We then divided by the amount of time to calculate an average data rate. With this test, we did make the assumption that the data collection rate on the payloads themselves would be constant, and as such, an average would be sufficient to validate the requirement. I would now like to hand it off to Jason Lathbury to discuss the payload subsystem experimental validation. Thank you, Matthew. As stated, my name is Jason Lathbury, and today I'll be talking to you about the payload subsystem experimental validation. 
Philip first up with the five payloads test. The customer specified that he wanted five physically independent payloads. These payloads were to collect atmospheric data, dynamics data, and video data. Our final design had a set of two video configuration payloads and three non-video configuration payloads. At the end of fabrication, we confirmed that we did in fact build two video configuration payloads and three non-video configuration payloads, thus satisfying the customer and validating the requirement. For the, mass, for the payloads mass test, the customer specified that he wanted the payloads to weigh no more than two kilograms each. Our design had the video configuration payloads coming in at 551 grams, whereas the non-video configuration payload would come in 478 grams. After fabrication, we weighed each payload, and as you can see, the masses actually came in under the theoretical mass by a small amount. However, we did, in fact, come in below the two kilogram limit, thus validating the requirement. For the impact test, we started by measuring the mass of the rod. Using that mass, we then used uh, energy methods to calculate a height required to drop the rod to generate our required 174.3 newtons with impact force. Using a PVC pipe to guide the rod, we dropped the rod onto the bottom face of the payloads after removing the attachment hardware on the top face and the expensive electronics, but leaving everything else in flight configuration. As you can see in the picture there, we did incur some damage from the impact. However, the requirements stated that the payloads must survive, where we define survive as being able to complete its objectives. And upon inspection, we determined that even though there was damage to the box, the payload itself could complete its objectives of gathering data. Therefore, we felt that we validated the requirement. Finally, looking at the data collection rate test, we ran all of the sensors, both dynamic and atmospheric, for a total of 60 seconds. We then counted up the number of data points that we got from those sensors and calculated a rate of 1 hertz for the atmospheric sensors and 3 hertz for the dynamic sensors. Both of these are well below the 100 hertz limit, thus validating the requirement. Some recommendations moving forward just in general for the payloads. We recommend adding some additional padding, perhaps a foam block onto the bottom face of the payload, even though we don't expect that kind of damage from a standard fall like we would plan to have, we would like to mitigate any possibility of damage. Further, we would like to modify the actual attachment strings from the top of the payload to the payload's bar during assembly and disassembly for flight. We found that the actual attachment method was somewhat time consuming and tedious and a simple redesign could save a lot of time and effort to get the system ready for flight. I'd now like to invite Jessica Jansen to come up here and talk about the structure subsystem. Thank you, Jason. As you said, my name is Jessica Jansen and I'll be discussing the structure subsystem. The structure subsystem team members are the same as that of the integration team that Andrew discussed earlier, that is myself, Adam Case, and Samantha Watson. And our subsystem has only one requirement, that is that the structure shall withstand a load of two Gs. So to test this, we conducted a drop test where the design metric investigated was experienced acceleration in Gs. Some of the assumptions we considered going into this test included uniaxial acceleration, that is we only measured the acceleration experienced in one axis, although there was ex experienced accelerations in all three. Second, that no losses were had between the structure itself and the accelerometers. We attached the accelerometers with wax, which is not quite as secure as perhaps bolts would be, but we assumed there were no losses. And finally, the most critical assumption is that all four legs landed at the same time, however impossible to to do this perfectly, we got as close as we could. Shown here is our test setup. You can see that we conducted the test in the Trust Lab in AxFab, and you can see we used fishing line to lift the structure over the truss. We wrapped the fishing line around the structure in a way that allowed us to adjust it so that it was as level as possible before we dropped it. And you can also see the location of each of the accelerometers we used. The two accelerometers were placed on either side of the electronics bar, so they were on the legs furthest from them. And you can also see our DAC system we used in order to obtain the data from the accelerometers and view them on the computer using LabVIEW. I'd like to show you a quick video of our test.
You can see we dropped it from about 1.23 meters, which is just slightly above our calculated height for the drop of 1.223 meters. And we did this on a concrete floor to best simulate launch and landing conditions that would be experienced out on the RC field for the launch site. I'd now like to invite Adam Case to come up and further discuss our validation. Thank you, Jessica. As Jessica stated, my name is Adam Case, and I'll be going over the structure subsystem experimental validation, as well as integration configuration management. After performing the drop test, the following figure was obtained from LabVIEW, where the two accelerometers used were attached to channels two and four. Now, the data acquired from the accelerometer attached to channel two was not used as there is a bunch of noise in the data. Looking closer at the accelerometer attached to channel four, the maximum acceleration that the structure experiences is 9.5 Gs. This is greater than the, theoretic, than the two Gs that the structure must withstand, thus experimentally validating the structure subsystem. Now, several improvements could be made to these structures drop test, two of which being the use of multiple accelerometers around the structure, as well as more accelerometers that had an acceleration range closer to the maximum expected acceleration that the structure would experience. Another improvement would be to perform a drop test where all four legs hit the ground at the exact same time. And while that is almost nearly impossible, uh, to do it in a much closer time period than we have in our original drop test. And finally, the structure was designed to withstand a 2G loading with the electronics, payloads, and propulsion subsystem attached. So performing a drop test with the entire system would further experimentally validate the structure's subsystem. Now I'll be moving on to the integration portion of this presentation. Here is the product structure tree for the Hades project. This shows how all of the parts come together to form subsystems, and these subsystems come together in order to form the Hades system. Here's an example uh, schematic for the Hades project. This showing the ESC subassembly schematic. This first page shows the entire subassembly all put together. And the second page shows the entire subassembly in an exploded view, as well as dimensions showing where several parts are placed within the subassembly. Here is an example bill of materials. Again, this shows the ESC subassembly schematic, or ESC subassembly. And this shows the parts used within the subassembly, as well as the part numbers and how many are used in them. Now, here is the product structure tree. Highlighted in green are all the documents that have been released for the subassemblies, and highlighted in red are all the documents for the subassemblies that have not been released at this time. I'd now like to invite Samantha Watson up to further go over the integration portion of this presentation. Thank you, Adam. As Adam mentioned, my name is Samantha Watson, and I will be wrapping up the integration portion of our presentation. Seeing here is the system level requirements for Hades and the metrics we would use to validate these requirements. The first requirement is that the platform will lift five payloads to a specified altitude. The metric we would use to validate that would be visual confirmation once it reached that altitude. The following three requirements where the platform shall deploy all of the payloads at an altitude greater than 100 meters and then descend safely back to the ground station or not deploy the payloads at an altitude greater than 100 meters but then still return to the ground station safely can all be validated through the use of two metrics. The first would be visual confirmation and the second would be data we would retrieve from our flight controller. The last requirement for our system is that the duration of our mission be greater than 20 minutes and the metric we'd use to validate that is time where we had timed the entire duration of our mission. These previously stated requirements have all been numerically validated through the through calculation and simulation. However, we were unable to perform a full system flight test, therefore none of our requirements have actually been experimentally validated. 
Some improvements for our system, however, and recommendations is that we would have more pre-planning before fabrication, as well as more pre-planning for our subsystem tests. We would also have multiple subsystem tests instead of just four or five, which is what our time allowed for, to have more accurate and more reliable data. We would also get early expert consultation from professors on campus. I'd now like to invite Andrew Burr back up for our system validation. Thank you, Samantha. Once again, my name is Andrew Burr, and I'll be going over the system validation. This table shown here shows how validating each of our requirements satisfy our system level objectives. As you'll see, our first two requirements state that the platform shall lift five payloads to a specified altitude, which is above 100 meters, where they will be deployed. This satisfy our system level objectives, stating that the platform should be capable of deploying five payloads from an altitude greater than 100 meters. It also satisfy our objectives, stating that the platform shall loiter at this specified altitude with and without deploying the payloads. Our next two system level requirements state that the platform shall descend from an altitude of greater than 100 meters after deploying the payloads and without deploying them. This satisfy our system level objectives, stating that the platform should land at the ground station after deploying payloads and without deploying them. As you can see, this requirement has an asterisk next to it to denote that it is a subsystem level requirement which is validated satisfying system level objectives. The requirement states that the payload sensors shall collect data at a rate of up to 100 hertz. This satisfies our objectives that the payloads will collect acceleration, air temperature, air pressure, and video data. Our next subsystem level requirement states that each payload shall survive an impact of up to 174.3 newtons. This satisfies our system level objectives that each payload should be capable of landing safely after being deployed from the platform and without being deployed from the platform. Our final subsystem level requirement states that the mass of each payload shall be less than two kilograms, satisfying our system level objective that the mass of each payload should be less than two kilograms. Our final system level requirement states that the duration of the mission shall be greater than 20 minutes, satisfying our system level objective that the mission duration shall be, should be greater than 20 minutes. One more requirement we have is that the platform shall be capable of receiving commands from a mission control station up to 212 meters away. This satisfies our system level objective that the platform should be capable of accepting commands from a mission control station. Our next table shows which of our system level objectives have been satisfied throughout our semesters of work. As you can see, our first set of objectives have not been satisfied, once again, due to what Samantha said, that we did not have the opportunity to perform a full system test. You'll see here that we did have the chance to satisfy one of our system level objectives. This was done by our payload subsystem, who satisfied the objective that the mass of each payload should be less than two kilograms. Our final system level objective, which was satisfied, was, that the uh, was done by our electronic subsystem, and it states that the platform should be capable of accepting commands from a mission control station. I'd now like to invite Cheryl Hang back up to wrap up our presentation. Thank you, Andrew. And now to close the presentation, I'll be go going over programmatics and lessons learned. For this project, we allocated a total of $2,200. And to date, we have utilized a total of $1,803 for this project. We have also spent a total of 5,094 hours on this project throughout the two semesters. And some lessons learned from this project is to utilize configuration management for system assembly, Manufacturers sometimes misrepresent or do not know a particular product specification. Double check that products to be bought meets the required specification needed. And to perform tests multiple times for more reliable data. Communication is important and it works both ways. Do not hesitate to ask or suggest ideas. And finally, it's better to be early than on time with regards to meeting deadlines and schedules. 
So in summary, we went over the design team structure, introduction of Hades, system definition, subsystem validation, integration, system validation, programmatics, and finally lessons learned. We would like to acknowledge these individuals for their assistance with the project, in particular Dr. Julio Benavides and Dr. Patrick McElwain. And we would like to extend our acknowledgement to these individuals as well for their assistance with the project. Are there any questions? site on the bottom of your payloads or did you just test it? Does that so, make sense? Um, that bottom phase was the smallest um, area of the box phase and also um, with the aid of the parachute um, usually hopefully it will come down all the way straight and only land on the bottom phase but that's not always the case but of course, um, taking into consideration that it's the smallest phase of the box, we use we use that phase to test out our impact test force. Impact, impact force test, what? Okay, yeah, part of one. Um, yeah, uh, Jason would like to add to that. Sorry, to add on, um, the payloads, the area that we dropped the rod was the thinnest and had the least actual material on the corners, on the edges, are actually thicker. Amount of the way the box is designed, it has uh, holes for adding screws and it's thicker material and then you have to reinforce it up in the walls and such. So we, when we did our numerical validation, we looked at a simply supported flat plate, uh, sorry, flat plate supported on both ends and we kind of went from there. So it was based off an assumption that the thinnest material furthest away from any supported material would be the weakest uh, spot on the box. Okay, good answer. Just want to make sure that if you land on the corner, it wasn't going to crack. Um, next, next question, kind of on the same topic. Um, what would happen if a parachute failed to deploy? So 
So for the payloads, the 174.3 newtons was actually an expected impact force if there was no payload deployment. Okay. Um, so that was at terminal velocity, including the drag of just a box. Okay. Maybe you guys said that and I wasn't paying attention. Um, all right, and slide 80. So this was actually really good. Uh, it shows that you guys are learning to leverage resources that you have going to your experts, and that you're also trying to figure out how to do the most with the fewest tests. Um, I know that's something I deal with a lot. Uh, you know, you've got to perform, say, four tests. You've got the money to do two. Which two do you do, uh, and why? So that was really good to see. Uh, the only other question that I have is, uh, what went wrong with your project, and what did you guys learn from it? Because I remember a lot went wrong with my project. Anyone can answer this. Huh? Uh, one thing that went wrong with our structure uh, was after first designing it, we didn't take enough consideration into how to actually uh, measure around the outside of the ring of where these motor plates are sitting. If you can see, there's uh, two motor plates that are extended a little bit longer than the rest. Uh, this is because after we measured um, and remeasured and remeasured, we still uh, didn't hit the mark and the props weren't equally spaced. Uh, we were concerned with how this would affect flight, so that was one thing that went wrong. Uh, and, and yeah, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just kind of curious what what caused you guys headaches and what you learned from them, uh, both figuratively and literally. Uh, Josh will take the mic now. <laughs> One uh, a really big issue that we had pretty much at the end of the project was um, we did multiple rounds of thrust testing. The thrust testing that we had with the data that was up there wasn't the only one. We wanted to keep retesting it to make sure things were good. And unfortunately, uh, one week before the project freeze on Friday afternoon, we were testing one of the we we're testing planning on testing all of them, and we went through our first set of thrust testing. And at about 25% throttle, the motor just stopped for absolutely no reason. Uh, we came to find out the next week uh, that the electronic speed controller that we were using failed. Uh, these are all, the motors and the controllers are all done in parts, so they're several years old and they've gone through a couple of projects already. And uh, talking to Jim Weber, who was a huge help for our project, um, he was saying that one of the capacitors had failed and actually pulled itself off the board when it marked itself. So it wasn't really working anymore, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> And then that led us to trying to overnight a new controller in time, and the just the time stack up kind of prevented us from flying in time. And so that was one of the big hurdles that we reached right at the end uh, that hampered our progress a great deal. And I'll pass it off to Jason now. This ties into one of our stated lessons learned. Uh, when we ordered the payloads boxes, the, custom, the project specification from the from Amazon basically when we ordered it ended up being wrong and they ended up the payloads boxes themselves ended up being something like two or three times heavier than we were initially expecting and this came at a time when the system as a whole was something like a kilogram and a half over weight and we represented about a third of that so, <laughs> so luckily when we finished actually manufacturing everything and putting it all together the final system weight ended up being within spec but for a while there we were rather panicking and trying to figure out how many lightning holes we can cut into this thing before we just completely ruin it. All right, well, good job, you guys. Thank you for presenting. You guys did a good job. Yeah, you guys were very professional. Um, not even, you know, just to the audience, but to, to each other. So that really came out, and I think that is that says a lot. And you guys had a really great presentation. Um, for me and, and for a lot of projects um, at NASA, off-nominal scenarios are really important. <laughs> um, so a couple questions with that. Did you guys, you know, if you had a, a propeller out, uh, contingency, you know, contingency scenario there, if you had a propeller out, you wouldn't meet your thrust requirements. Did you look at any situations like that where, I don't know if you could, uh, We did. Uh, for the sake of our testing, we only ran them up to 
the manufacturer recommended maximum RPM for these. Um, the motors, however, and the ESCs are capable of significantly more power. Um, for the sake of our thrust testing, the 290 that we showed up there, uh, that was somewhere in the ballpark of about 44 amps continuous through the, based on our data logging. Uh, the motors themselves are capable of 65 amps continuously and 80 amps at burst current. So we looked at it a lot. Um, there was actually a great deal of data and information on these propellers, which is why we used them, or one of the reasons why we used them. And based on that data and our simulations, um, if we were to have a propeller out situation while the system was up, if as long as the flight controller could correct itself and keep itself stable, they could overburst the, they could uh, over amp the motors or well over rev the propellers in order to have a controlled landing. Um, we did some testing that went over the RPM, and I know uh, the other team did a lot of uh, uh, Pafis did a lot of testing over the RPM limit and. We kind of couldn't get any of these propellers to break, even when we were significantly over the maximum RPM limit. So we did take a look at that and have a general idea, and we came with the conclusion that the most difficult part, if we were to have a propeller on run on five, would be just to keep the system stable. It should, in theory, have enough thrust to have a controlled landing if you were to have a propeller out situation. Thanks. That's really, really good, important information. Um, another question with the kind of, you know, off nominal scenarios, and you guys mentioned it, but um, with the drop testing, you guys looked at all four legs connecting um, to the ground. Did you look at, you know, having anything, you know, landing at, a, at an angle? Um, any other off nominal drop testing? I'll pass it off to Jessica Jansen. So we did look into that and we did want to test it and ironically as we were trying to drop the structure as level as possible, the first couple of times that didn't happen perfectly so we actually inadvertently did test it landing on one leg at a time and it survived perfectly fine. So um, we wanted to do more testing where we landed on one leg per, but time didn't allow for us to do that deliberately but we did do it. Um, so it, it, it was fine. <laughs> By default, you got yes. that one in. Yes, we did. That's good. Yeah. good. Those, those are really good answers to that question. Um, the other question I had is, maybe it wasn't clear, do you guys have any wind constraints during during the actual test? Yes, um, our wind constraint is uh, 9 meters per second, so 20 miles an hour maximum. Okay, okay. Um, and then what simulation? So, kind of later in the presentation it was like oh you know we used a simulation of, I, I i know nothing about the simulation i didn't hear much about that that is that's that's my jam so um what simulation did you guys use did that simulation did you look at any uncertainties to include um you know in case you have an off nominal day uh we built a simulation in matlab to simulate the entire flight uh but the only thing that we could really change was just different variables such as which wind direction or how fast is the wind and stuff like that. So, And what at what times do we want to drop which payloads? And okay. does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of would have liked to see maybe a lit, like one slide on it mm -hmm. or if you had a backup slide or something like that. Uh, Jason has something else to add. <laughs> so we can get lunch. Sorry. Could you go back to the very Yes, exactly. So this is actually a direct representation, if we go to the next slide also. This is a direct representation of that MATLAB simulation rendered in Google Earth. So these lines are directly from our actual simulation itself. So the gray line there is our projected flight, and the green line there is our projected payload shift. So originally the uh, bright blue circle that you see there was a combination of our maximum expected payload drift. Okay. And that was with, and that's how we came up with our nine meters per second uh, wind, I guess, limit. Uh, because the blue circle there is also limited by physical structures here on campus as well as property lines. So we said this is as far as we can allow things to go. What is a very conservative estimate? What does that give our payloads to go to? And then rerunning the simulation with a little bit more accurate uh, representation of what the drags would look like with the payloads. That's how we got the green line there. As you can see, this simulation actually was done with eight, that nine meters per second uh, wind in the southeast direction. Okay, that, that kind of detail is really good to have at least in backup, you know, in, in the in the slide package. I know you guys are pressed for time, but that's really important to me anyway. 
Um, then the next question that I had, and last one, oh, what, what configuration management system database do you guys use to keep all your drawings and documents? Excel. <laughs> anything better that gets them access to besides Excel, but that's that's always a big thing. It was, a, it was a library that was uh, developed by Jim Lyle back in our days. Okay. With quite a literally back in our days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and then the last comment that I had, I love that you guys had a, a lessons learned chart um, of that is so important. And, you know, for a lot of these missions at NASA, there is a laundry list of lessons learned that, that we put together but at times, you lose a lot of people from the project as they move on to other things, and so those lessons learned aren't necessarily documented and passed on to other projects as they should be. And that is, a, a, that's like gold right there. So I don't know if you have any way to kind of formally document the lessons learned, maybe even pass it on to other classes, but that's, that's really important when you get out in industry, so I was happy to see that, that slide. So nice work, guys. Thank you. Julio, how much time do I have? Uh, five minutes. All right. Six minutes. You just cut me off. <laughs> so first of all, I want to uh, uh, also say that it's a very polished presentation, presenters. Thank you. Um, and uh, I want to say that good use of labeling on your diagrams of key parts and components and uh, members of the team. And then um, also like making the dimensions clear to give perspective that that can never look. Because you know, you're working that ground and you know that that's, but also we have the live version so that helps as well to understand the, uh, the scale of the, uh, of the system. Um, thank you for the pictures and the videos of the tests that you were able to perform. That's always very helpful to be part of the <coughs> uh, context for the results. Um, I did find one slide that I'm going to complain about, uh, <laughs> so because I can't give you 100% of the entire presentation, uh, slide 72. So readability fail. So, uh, so, and I know that I, we use the same system back in our uh, uh, dinosaur days. So, um, so certainly, uh, sometimes when the tool does not allow you to give the good presentations, I know you have to remake it a part of other tool to relay the same information for your audience. I was having a hard time reading it, so I'm sure everybody in the back would be able to see um, so kind of a slide waste it. So, but, so one slide you guys, you guys can get a pass on. Um, you guys talked about you had a component fail. Certainly, that gave you a uh, lesson learned into uh, duplication and part uh, lifetime. Um, did you talk about, did you any, notice any duplication in battery performance or maybe even like motor performance? Um, sorry, can you repeat your question? Again? Sure. Did you notice as you guys were doing your test uh, any duplication in your battery, like capacity performance or maybe motor performance? Um, I'll let myself to check for you. Just speaking on the batteries, no, we did not. They were brand new and they performed exactly the way expected. We didn't really use them for anything other than uh, motor testing and maybe one or two functionality demos, which didn't deplete the batteries really whatsoever. But uh, over the two discharge cycles that we did deplete them down to 80%, we, we did not notice any, any uh, anything that that indicated a uh, degradation in performance. And uh, I can discuss the, the motor portion. Uh, we did run multiple rounds of testing, like I was saying earlier, actually over a couple of different weeks. Uh, when we were running these tests, we didn't notice any per significant propeller or thrust drops, uh, or based on throttle settings, the amperage and power that was pulled based on our data loggers. Everything seemed pretty consistent. Uh, we were operating inside when we did all of our thrust tests in the same exact setup every time, even across different days. Uh, with one exception, uh, at the very end of the project, we worked with one of the mechanical engineering capstone projects that designed a motor test stand. Uh, and they, were, they helped us out a great deal. We were able to use their test stand to help correlate our own numbers. And that was a test that was outside, and it was a, a horizontal test stand rather than the vertical one that we had set up. Uh, and we actually got better thrust data when it was a horizontal set. We're assuming because uh, the way we had our thrust test set up, it was pretty much dumping all of the prop wash into the ground and it was completely surrounded on all sides by, you know, blast shield and different things like that. So we think oh, there was a lot of recirculation into the props that actually dropped our thrust value. Because um, we did get a little bit more, I think it was almost half a pound better thrust across the board when we had the same RPM ranges and power ranges. 
when we ran it outside with a horizontal that didn't have all of that shielding. So, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, certainly. Um, okay. Oh, I was uh, kind of a resounding uh, lack theme that I noticed was uh, margins. So you guys presented results at what the requirement was and what the actual values achieved, but um, I never saw a single kind of a, so I can calculate the margins, but certainly I think in some cases you had margins that were zero. Um, I think, uh, particularly, actually, in uh, one area where I don't believe you're, that you met the requirement is the mission lifetime. Because you said that you'd hover for 19 minutes and you're required for this mission left in 20 minutes. I'm like, that gives you half a minute to get up, half a minute to get down for any adjustment. So, um, so, so 20 yeah. minutes is the minimum. So, at least 20 minutes for mission duration. So, we can go um, over 20 minutes. So, loitering time is, is um, approximately 19 minutes because um, going up there and according to the simulation, it wouldn't take more than um, a minute to go up there and it wouldn't take more than a minute to come down as well. So um, with that, it will meet our requirement of at least a 20 minute duration for the mission. Okay, I would have seen, I think, a lot, because if there's wind, if there's, you know, it's not going up as fast as you expected, because, so I would have liked to see more margin in that field of thing. Really, uh, operation, operation, we want a lot more margin in that, so even at the, the minimum level, so the less Thank you, we'll take yeah. the, the consideration. Okay. Um, why didn't you guys go beyond 212 meters? Because that just tests the requirement. That gives me again no, no, no info on what the margin of can be go. And now, if you could pull up select 44. So the 212 meter requirement was generated from the safety cylinder distance, which was the the location where the emission control station would be uh, positioned to with respect to the launch location, which was a 50 meter radius. And since the farthest we could go upwards is 120, 122 meters, I believe. Uh, 100 meters. Well, I mean, in terms of uh, the, the ceiling for the legal limit. So what we did is we took that uh, uh, diagonal distance from that to where the max possible furthest location that the uh, that the uh, platform would be in, with respect to the mission control station, and we added a factor of safety of 1.5 to that distance. So the 212 is a little bit overkill, but uh, since we added a factor of safety of 1.5, we found that that was pretty adequate because we would still like to communicate with it if it did happen to fly outside of the operational cylinder. So that's why we built in that uh, 1.5, and that's why it's uh, 212. Okay. And on this chart particularly, he said that uh, the 212, that, so I guess it's about, what, 50% uh, signal strength? But that tells me, I, I don't know if 50 is reasonable. What, what is the market for reasonable and meeting the requirement? Is it 10%, 20%, was it 90%? And so there was no actual performance metric that you were trying to track that, just for yourself. So what is the acceptable strength of signal strength? So the acceptable signal strength for this uh, requirement, uh, you were right, it was not clearly defined. We took 50% or anything basically over zero as still receiving communication. It would be ideal to put margins on that though. Certainly, and I think but for safety uh, reasons, you probably want more than 50%. Just for percent uh, To add to Jeff's answer to that, the mission planning software that we were using, if the communication signal was anything below what was acceptable, we would receive an error that stated that there were bad packets received or not enough packets received. So that's an additional safety feature that is built in that we didn't design, but it's something that we didn't use. So during this test, we did not receive any of those errors. Okay. Um, let's see, slide 58. Um, so did you guys have a, is, did you test the act, one of the actual payloads in this destructive uh, the APAC force test, or did you have a separate unit that you could test in destruction? One of the actual payloads, if we flipped it over, one of them would have that correct unit. Okay, so that's probably a lesson learned in having a spare for at least type of things where if the, you know that it's going to be probably a very destructive test to have that, because now if I was a customer for one of those goes, I wouldn't want that unit <laughs> because it's been broken. <laughs> So, um, so less, hopefully a lesson learned uh, there for getting spared, especially if you're going to be destructive tests or potentially having a destructive test there. Um, uh, on 
slide 64. Uh, okay, so uh, this has to do with, um, there was mention of that you guys added wax as a way to uh, the holy cell numbers. Wouldn't wax act as a dampener? Likely, maybe. Yeah, it could. Um, and we assumed that it didn't. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay, so just as uh, something to know, so it's probably skewed the result, the results a little bit. Um, also, on that particular test, when you guys have dropped it from the uh, meter, um, why not add ballast to actually have a more realistic representation of what the final system would look like? So maybe go running to the gym and getting some of those weights and getting it to a level what you think with the actual, what the actual, you know, the show. So what I'm trying to get at, there's a very common theme in the industry called the Glasgow test, test tested to fly. So that test would not pass that because it wasn't in the system configuration that you would actually fly. So um, did you guys think about adding that list? So if, not, if yes, why didn't you? I think at one point in time we thought about dropping our entire system. Unfortunately, like we can't do that because we can't guarantee that all the other parts will make it. But the struggle we have with adding that additional weight is our structure is so customized that it's it would be very difficult to add the weight in the correct spots to have the correct responses without probably breaking quite a few things. That's why we didn't add as much as we could have. Okay. Uh, again, there's a test as you fly plus you test. So if I was in a final review and you can go ahead to apply this, I would have probably let you get, guys get away without that meeting that particular mantra. And part of that too is this was a uh, we put it as a subsystem level requirement. What we could have and maybe should have done was also put it as a system level requirement where there was a different um, value that we would have to hit with all of the system weight attached. So that's a lesson learned for us as well. Okay, good, good. Um, two more items. Uh, just one note, uh, quality insurance and parts inspection is so critical in this, especially if you don't know it. So as you guys have learned that lesson the hard way, um, inspection and not trusting your vendors Zero trust, or trust but verify. So that is, you gotta build in quite a bit of time. And almost every industry, well, not almost every, every place will have quality insurance inspection time bank to get into that part that you're receiving from your vendors and that you build yourself. So that's, I think, a lesson that you guys hopefully picked up and will now know. And will be kind to the quality insurance folks when you out in the industry because they get a lot of slack. So, um, and the last uh, item that I wanted to bring up, did you guys write anything operating procedures? Uh, um, for, I know that you guys didn't get to test it, but did you write operating procedures? Uh, yes, we have two system flight test plan, but it's not um, discussed in this presentation. Okay. Well, again, thank you and good job.